excellent driving. All right, so the lymphatic system. You can see an uh, image of the lymphatic system here, a representation of the lymphatic system here. Basically, the lymphatic system is a system of vessels and accessory organs that are going to help to maintain a hygienic environment for the human organism. So the term lymphatic system, this is what would be referred to as a true organ system. And hopefully you know all of our other true organ systems. There are things like the circulatory system, respiratory system, endocrine system, nervous system. These are the organ systems that we are dealing with in this class. There is another system that frequently people are like, oh yeah, that's the organ system. And that's the immune system. The immune system and the lymphatic system are not synonymous. The lymphatic system is simply the host of what we refer to as the immune system. So the lymphatic system hosts the immune system. These are not the same thing. Lymphatic and immune are not the same thing. The immune system, a component of the lymphatic system, is going to simply be a group of cells that are distributed throughout the body. And that, those group of cells are going to help out with what's known as immunity. And this is a systematic way in which we deal with and destroy microorganisms and help to heal after infection. So this immune system, these groups of cells, even though frequently people will refer to the lymphatic or the immune system as synonymous with the lymphatic system, is not a true organ system. Okay, so just kind of want to start out with that. The lymphatic system is the true organ system. It plays host to the immune system. When you reference the immune system, you are only referencing a small portion of the lymphatic system. You're, in fact, just referencing the cells that are present that help out with immunity. So let's move on and deal with some basic functions of our lymphatic system. Uh, obviously, immunity, the immune system, is going to be one of our functions. But there are additional functions as well. One of these, and we've already sort of alluded to this uh, last uh, on Wednesday when we were discussing um, capillary exchange, we knew that there was a buildup of additional water or fluid in our tissue as that exchange happens. It's going to be the lymphatic system that is going to be responsible for this fluid recovery. So the lymphatic system collects fluid from our tissue beds. And again, if we have, um, well, we're recovering that which was not recovered in that capillary exchange process. So I'm just going to call that via circulation. If we don't collect it, we have an imbalance. Anyone remember what that imbalance was called? Looks like edema, pronounced edema. So we're constantly uh, bringing in or recovering this fluid. Once that fluid enters into the lymphatic vessels, we are going to refer to that fluid, the collected fluid. You're going to refer to that simply as lymph. Okay. So this fluid recovery produces lymph and then also transports lymph from the tissue beds back up to circulation at the subclavian veins. Oops. 
Now the second, or a second um, function here is going to be immunity. I'm not spelling that word ever right. Immunity, there we go. Now the immunity, as we accumulate lymph, that lymph is going to contain debris. And what debris is contained in the lymph is going to depend on the status of the organism. So if you're uh, sick, you're going to have a higher concentration of bacteria and viruses and broken up pieces of bacteria and viruses and other parasites. Um, if you're healthy, you're still going to have some of that stuff present because even though you're healthy, you still are constantly interacting with microorganisms and those microorganisms are going to um, they're always going to need to be cleansed and removed from, um, from the organism and from the organs and the tissue. So lymph is going to contain the debris. And as that fluid moves up towards the subclavian vein from the tissue beds, it's going to pass through an accessory organ known as a lymph node. And when it gets passed through the lymph node, the lymph node houses a bunch of immune cells. And those immune cells interact with that debris and clean and remove the debris from the fluid. So um, we'll talk about each of these in a little more detail here shortly. Just trying to right now introduce some of these basic functions. The last real basic function here is going to be lipid absorption. We have a very unique lymphatic system that's associated with the, uh, the gastroenteric system. So it's associated with our digestive system. Uh, mixed into the digestive tissue, we're going to have lymph uh, lymphatic vessels that actually are going to facilitate that are going to facilitate the absorption of lipids that you consume in your diet. So we have our specialized lymph vessels that are found in the gut. Now, if you think back to either the biochemistry that you learned in this class or maybe biochemistry that you had in your chemistry class, you're going to recognize that lipids are actually very big molecules. Lipids are also hydrophobic, and so they don't mix well with watery solutions, things like blood, and even really things like lymph. So we package these things up to make them a little bit more hydrophilic, which makes them even bigger. The packets become so big that they can't directly cross through the capillaries of the digestive system. So they actually are going to be moved through the more um, loose-fitting lymphatic capillaries, get picked up by the lymphatic capillaries. So the lipids that are left over, they get picked up here by the lymphatic vessels or the lymphatic capillaries and they are not being absorbed that's supposed to be a not not absorb that's supposed to be a B <laughs> wow <laughs> absorbed <laughs> not absorbed <laughs> not absorbed by a capillaries So we form, as you can see in the picture over here, we have from the gut, we create, oh man, I really wish I had that. I don't know why the arrow doesn't show up. Um, so we have in the gut production of these basically uh, packets that are a little bit more hydrophilic. 
and they get pulled through the digestive wall and they get re, uh, uh, retaken up by the cells of the digestive wall, moved across and then deposited not into a blood capillary but into, um, into the, the lymphatic system. So the lymph coming from the digestive system is referred to as lacteal. And the name is basically saying, oh, there's a lot of lipids that are present. And lipids are kind of a white consistency. And the lacteal becomes this really milky white kind of disgusting substance. And it's going to get cleaned on the way back to the heart, or not to the heart, to the uh, circulation. And so this lacteal gets incorporated into the lymph that's being delivered from all the other locations, all the other tissue bod, uh, beds in the body, and gets deposited and delivered to the bloodstream. And it's going to be done through a very big anatomical vessel known as a duct. And we have two different ducts in uh, the lymphatic anatomy, and we're actually going to discuss those things uh, very shortly. Both of those ducts, by the way, drain into the left and right subcutaneous veins, just below the clavicle. Okay, so let's take a look here at some basic anatomy. The lymphatic system is made up of four major components. We have the lymph itself which is the fluid. We have lymphatic vessels. And then we have lymphatic tissues. And finally, the fourth component are lymphatic organs. So we have lymphatic fluid, vessels, tissues, and organs. And we're going to just work our way down this list and we'll try to highlight each of these components in more anatomical detail, starting with the lymph. So the lymph, I mean, in all reality, the base component for the lymph is basically blood plasma, right? Blood plasma is a watery component that enters into the tissue bed. Most of it gets picked back up by the circulation, but some of it's left over. And that leftover is going to be recovered by the lymphatic system. So lymph really, at its base ingredient, is similar to blood plasma. Similar to blood plasma, and it's going to contain some of the um, same ingredients, but it's going to not include, so minus some of the proteins. Because remember, we know that the proteins aren't really crossing the capillary bed all that efficiently. So we're going to have some differences in the protein makeup of the lymph. Now this is just sort of the base. It's going to look similar to blood plasma, but it can change based off of the status of the organism. So it's going to change with the organism's status. So what are some things that could change that may alter the appearance or the composition of lymph. Well, one of the things is you can consume a meal. And it shouldn't surprise you that post-meal, once you've consumed a meal, this blood plasma that is forming the lymph is going to become more fat because we're going to pick up lipids. 
And this is especially happening in the digestive tract lymphatic vessels. And so if we were to assay or look at and observe the lymphatic solution or fluid from the digestive system, it's going to appear very milky white due to the presence of lipid. <coughs> now, after a meal, the lymphatic drainage in other organs is going to not be affected. This is only going to be the lacteal being produced by the lymphatic vessels that we find in the digestive system. Now, that's eventually going to mix in with the rest of the lymphatic vessel changing, uh, or I'm sorry, in the rest of the lymphatic fluid changing the lymph as we move back towards the heart. But it becomes exceptionally milky white after a meal in that digestive tract. Okay, there's a couple other things that can happen that change how the lymph actually appears. Another one is dehydration. During dehydration, the lymph becomes a little bit thicker because we have a decreased water content. And then probably the biggest thing that will happen to the lymph is during illness. And during illness, we'll have an increase in the number of bacteria and other microbes that are present. Viruses will also be picked up by the lymphatic system. Other types of illnesses um, that are not really related to microbes, one of the examples is cancer. Cancer causes cells that go under, undergo um, a, a mutation. We call them, uh, we call those cells oncotic cells because they have oncogenes, they have cancer-causing genes. When those genes, I'm sorry, not genes, when those cells begin to travel, that's called metastasizing they are going to use the lymphatic system. <coughs> so we can also, uh, if we have an individual cancer, we'll have metastasizing cancer cells using the lymph as one of the ways in which those cells will transfer to new tissues. The appearance of lymph is actually going to be location dependent as well. So it will change along the system. So we're starting, we're going to find out we have capillaries lymphatic capillaries that interact with the tissue bed, and as we move towards the subclavian veins, we're increasing the size of the vessels uh, along the way. Uh, in addition, as we move closer and closer to the subclavian veins, the lymph interacts with an increasing number of lymph nodes, which are one of our accessory organs. After a node, I'm going to call that simply post node. So after the lymph has interacted with a lymph node, we would actually see an increase in the number of lymphocytes that are incorporated into the lymph. Furthermore, the lymph is going to travel through or near tissues of certain organs. And there are several hormones that are initially incorporated into the lymph on the way to the bloodstream. And then lastly, as we move around the lymphatic system, we could find varying levels of cellular debris that are present. So the lymph is constantly changing as it moves along the lymphatic system. Um, 
in, in, in a variety of different ways. All right, the next component, our second component of the lymphatic system are going to be the lymphatic vessels. Lymphatic vessels are frequently just simply referred to as lymphatics. And so this is a collective name for every different size of lymphatic vessel that we're going to find in the lymphatic system. Now, the lymphatics, they actually have many similarities to blood vessels. One of the major differences is the capillaries are blind on one end. And what that means is we don't have anything that's analogous to an artery capillary vein like we do in the circulatory system. We start in the tissue bed with blind ended capillaries that only move in one direction towards what really resemble very similar, very similarly to, to the veins. So blind ended just simply means that we don't have two sides to our capillaries, our lymphatic capillaries. There's no arterial or venous side. Are we good? Everybody got all of this? So the place to really begin in the conversation of these lymphatic vessels, these lymphatics, is to start at what are known as terminal lymphatics, which are also known as lymphatic capillaries. So our lymphatic capillaries, again, these are going to be blind-ended, and they're going to be incorporated into the tissue bed. So this figure that you're looking at here, it represents the circulatory capillaries and also distributes in green lymphatic capillaries or terminal lymphatics. Now these capillaries, these lymphatic capillaries, they inhabit most, and I'm going to underline most, most of the body. We actually do not find these lymphatic capillaries in the brain or the bone. So all of our other tissues, just not the brain and the bone. The lymphatic capillary, almost said lymphatic casserole. Oh, yeah, I'll try the lymphatic ca ca casserole, please. Worst decision I ever made. The, the lymphatic capillaries are uh, loose fit endothelial cells. So the endothelial cells, we, we've already are familiar with capillaries having endothelial cells. But most of them are the um, really tight knit capillaries that just have little slits between the endothelial cells. These are much looser. So if we were to draw these out, we would have larger gaps between individual cells of the lymphatics. 
And because they're blind ended, they look more like a loose sack of endothelial cells. So this would be very high resolution detail of the blind end lymphatic capillary. Now, in addition to the space uh, around, uh, or between, I should say, the, the endothelial cells, they also have a little bit more fluidity. And what I mean by that is they're more like a flap rather than just an opening. So the endothelial cells, they form a flap, and that flap can open and close with changes in pressure. I'm just going to put change in pressure there as delta P. So changes in pressure can help to open and close those flaps. And by having this loose structure, this allows large molecules to enter into the lymph. Now what you're looking at in this picture, in it, around each of these uh, flaps or, or openings, there's actually going to be anchoring filaments that help to tether the lymphatic capillary and the cells into place. tethered or anchored in place. Now, as we move away, so we begin to generate our solution, that blood-like plasma begins to funnel into the lymphatic capillaries, picks up proteins and hormones. If it's the digestive system, it's picking up lipids. And we're beginning to build this composition of our lymph as it draws out of the lymphatic capillaries. It's maybe going to have bacteria and other microorganisms if you're sick. And as that solution builds up, it begins to flow. And it's going to flow into the next sort of level of lymphatics, which are going to be known as collecting vessels. So lymphatic capillaries to lymphatic vessels. And really what a lymphatic vessel is, is it is going to be a convergence of lymphatic capillaries. So several or many lymphatic capillaries come together, converge to form a collecting vessel. Now these collecting vessels incorporated into the tissue are actually going to run in parallel right alongside the veins and arteries. So we run parallel to the veins and arteries. And as these collecting vessels, as we move along the collecting vessels, you can see here from our capillary bed, we're eventually going to enter into our lymphatic vessels, collecting vessels, and we're going to make our way towards lymph nodes. So eventually we empty into our lymph nodes. The lymph nodes which are considered accessory organs to the lymphatic system, are going to be spaced at irregular intervals along the vessel. Now, if you think back to circulation, you know the capillaries drain into veins. And remember that we're trying to move the blood and also now the lymph back towards the heart against the effects of gravity. 
And so the lip flow is also going to be retarded by the fact that it's being pulled down by gravity towards our feet. So the lymphatic vessels are also going to contain one-way valves very similar to our blood vessels on the lymphat or on the uh, venous side of the circulatory system. So just like you can see here in the uh, image that I'm showing from the lymphatic capillaries, we move through lymphatic vessels and we interact in uh, lymph nodes all along the way. So it'd be lymphatic vessels, lymph nodes, lymphatic vessels, lymph nodes, lymphatic vessels, lymph nodes, mul multiple sites along the lymphatic circulation where the lymph is being cleansed through the lymph, lymph nodes. And then eventually these vessels are going to begin to converge and they converge down on lymphatic trunks. There's not supposed to be a C. Trunks. So lymphatic trunks. Uh, again, convergence here. Of lymphatic vessels and we have multiple lymphatic trunks and these lymphatic trunks are going to drain some of the major portions or major areas of the body. So here's just uh, some examples of some of the lymphatic trunks that are going to be present in the human body. And I want you to be aware of six trunks. And each of these is going to drain a specific portion. So one of them, you can see here, draining the head and the neck is going to be the jugular trunk. Then we're going to have the subclavian trunk, and the subclavian trunk is actually going to drain, this is going to be the right upper limb. The next is the bronchomediastinal, and the bronchi bronchomediastinal trunk is going to be the trunk that drains the thoracic cavity and the, uh, the lungs as well. The intercostal trunk is going to drain areas around the rib cage. Uh, and also um, uh, below to, towards the diaphragm in that area. And then we have the intestinal trunk, which drains the left foot. Really? No one's going to. The intestinal trunk drains the intestines. <laughs> the left foot? Really? Why would they call it intestinal? No one got it. I don't even know why I try anymore. <laughs> and then we'll have the lumbar, which is going to drain the, the region of the spine known as the lumbar, and then also our lower limbs. So lower legs, or the legs and the lumbar are going to drain through the, uh, the lumbar trunk. So these are major, major drainage networks. Uh, really the, 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 big, the big vessel of the major drainage network out of those major body areas. Eventually, these are all going to make their way into lymphatic ducts. The lymphatic duct is the largest of the vessels, and it is a convergence of lymphatic trunks. So all of these lymphatic trunks are going to drain 
into these lymphatic ducts. And we're going to drain into two ducts. One is going to be the right lymphatic duct, which you can see here, and it's going to drain into, it's basically the right lymphatic duct is going to provide right side drainage. So it's convergence of the right hand, versions of 1, 2, and 3. And I'm using 1, 2, and 3 here, referencing these numbers up here. So we're talking about jugular, subclavian, and bronchomediastinal. The right hand versions of those lymphatic trucks. Again, this is right side drainage. And as we drain that right side, we're draining the lymph. That lymph is going to be deposited to the right subclavian. Okay, the right subclavian vein. Uh, the other trunk is the thoracic trunk. Uh, I'm sorry, not trunk. I'm saying trunk. Am I saying trunk? Duck. These are ducts. Thoracic duct. The right lymphatic duct, the thoracic duct. Now the lumbar, and, and really there are two, there's a right and left lumbar lymphatic. The two lumbar and then the intestinal trunk, they actually converge in the lower, basically right, right around um, uh, mid-abdomen. So right around in this area. And it's not really shown, but the, the area that they converge, they converge into a sac. And that sac, I'm going to spell it out first, and then I'll pronounce it for you. That sac is known as the cistern, the cistern chyme. And actually, I do have a picture. Now let's go ahead and take a look at this convergence point. So here you can see the... Um, thoracic cavity and just below the diaphragm you have this sac like structure with the two lumbar for, uh, uh, lymphatic trunks and the intestinal trunk are going to come together they form this sac now this cistern chyle exists to act as a collection depot It's a collection depot. What do you think we're actually going to collect there? I'll give you a hint. It has to do with what's being drained out of the lymphatic that is surround, the lymphatic surrounding the intestine. What? Oh, lipids. It sounded like you were saying rivets. Rivets. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So it's going to be a collection of that fatty digestive lymph, or what we would refer to as the lacteal. From the uh, sister and Kylie, we're actually going to follow up. Uh, alongside the aorta, remember the aorta actually descends down through here. You have the abdominal aorta that makes its way down through that midline. 
So it follows the aorta toward the heart. And we're going to pick up additional lymphatics here, the uh, left side or left hand versions of um, the subclavian, the bronchomediastinal, and then um, whatever I said the other one was. <laughs> what is that word? Is that the, uh, That's one, two, three. <laughs> Gotcha. It's Morris code. It's dot 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 dash 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 dot dot dot. Uh, so the thoracic trunk eventually is going to, after draining all of these regions of the body, deposit the lymph in the left subclavian. Okay, we still need to talk a, a little bit more about lymphatic cells and tissues and, and lymphatic organs, but before we do that, I want to deviate just a little bit or maybe chase a little bit of a rabbit trail here. Um, and I want to talk about lymph flow. So we're going to come back and we'll talk about lymphatic cells and lymphatic tissue and the uh, lymphatic organs uh, at, in a little while, probably after break. But um, lymphatic flow, we, we really, we're in the same issue that we have with our blood, right? Because we have to move the lymph against the effects of gravity. But we have one additional conundrum that we have to adjust for. There's no heart. There's no pump in this system. So we have to move lymph without the heart against the effects of gravity back up towards the heart. In all reality, it's going to be very similar to venous return. And we've already talked a little bit about uh, one of the anatomical features that's going to help with this process, which is going to be the vessel or the uh, valves that exist in the in the vessels, the one way one way valves. Again, no heart to do any sort of pumping or induce any sort of pressure, and so that means that these valves are very low pressure valves. I'm sorry, very low pressure vessels. Now the return here towards the subclavian veins is actually going to be really slow speed. It's much slower than what we would find in the circulatory system. Remember the circulatory system, we're trying to cycle our whole blood volume every day. This is going to be much slower rate than that. Everybody good? So in order to achieve the required lymph flow, we're going to have some very rhythmic contractions of these vessels. And the rhythmic contraction of these vessels is going to be achieved through three mechanisms. So three mechanisms of pumping to induce lymphatic flow back towards the subclavian veins. We're going to have, again, a skeletal muscle pump. And this is basically the same mechanism as what we found with the bloodstream. So this will be a similar or the same mechanism as the blood mechanism. So every time the muscles contract, and the muscles, remember, are constantly contracting because we're trying to maintain muscles, muscle tone so we can maintain optimal sarcomere. And as that tone kind of quivers on the lymphatic vessels, it's pushing on that lymph, creating a pressure to move the lymph forward. And we're going to have the backflow being prevented by the valves. 
the second method of lymph flow is known as the arterial pulse pump. The arterial pulse pump. Because a lot of the lymphatic system runs in parallel with arteries and veins, every time the heart beats and sends a pulse wave down the artery, that's translated onto the lymphatic vessels. So because the lymphatics run with the arteries, that pulse wave is actually going to press on the lymphatic vessel and is going to help to move the lymphatic uh, the lymphatics back through or through the one-way valves on the way back towards the subclavian veins. And then lastly, the third mechanism is going to be the respiratory pump. And the respiratory pump, every time we breathe, so we have breath by breath, changes in pressure. Have not got to the respiratory system just yet, but the thoracic cavity opens up, increasing volume. Whenever volume is increased, we have a concomitant decrease in pressure. So every time you breathe, the volume of the thoracic cavity, the subclavian veins are contained within this, vol within this volume, pressure is going to decrease. So we drop pressure down, and that makes these other two mechanisms more effective at moving the lymphatic or moving the lymph along the lymphatic vessels. And again, really the uh, essential here is uh, is to prevent backflow. And we're going to prevent backflow of lymph because of those one-way valves. So if those valves weren't present or if those valves were not working, you just have lymph that just was squishing around and would never make any real progress of moving that lymphatic solution back towards the subclavian vein. Wish you a very happy spring break.